the privilege that we have to be in the house. And God, as we pray for ourselves right now, God, we pray that you would touch us, change our hearts, help us, transform us. God, we want to be a light in darkness, but in order to be that light, God, we've got to shine bright. And God, we pray today that you would help us to shine brighter than we've ever shone before. That God, you would do something in our lives like you've never done before in our lives. And God, that this would be the beginning of a new day. We love you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, shout amen in the house. Come on, high five two people around you. Say, who are you inviting? Come on, who's sitting with you at Easter? Who's sitting with you at Easter? Amen, amen, amen. amen. Wow. Did anyone tell I haven't preached for two weeks? Who can tell I'm ready to preach today? I'm ready. Wow, thank God for those that have covered in our place. Come on, Pastor Pete started this series two weeks ago. An incredible message talking about from here to there. Who enjoyed that? As we're looking at Mind the Gap, that's our series. Looking at the gap of where we are, but where God wants us to be. Last week, Pastor Robert, an incredible message. Can these burnt stones live? What was he showing us? That God can use any one of us. Amen. God can use every failure and mistake of our life because every test in our life, God makes a testimony. Oh and God can use that because the last time I checked, I'm not getting anything from someone who's perfect. Because right. I can't relate to that. Yeah. But when I hear people say, I was like that and I did that and God changed my life, I'm going to listen because that's what I need in my life because I mess up and I fail and I'm a burnt stone. But thank God for His grace that I have a place in the wall. Does anyone have a place in the wall of God? That God is re-establishing us. And I'm so glad that in God we're not written off. But I'm so glad that we're written in. We're written into the Lamb's Book of Life. That book that God uses when the trump of God sounds. And our name through knowing Him is in that book. So you see, our goal every week, can I just share this with you again? Our goal every week when we stand behind this pulpit is for you to know God. Maybe for some of you, it may be the first time that you hear about God today or that you hear about God in this way because we hear about God in so many wrong ways. Yeah. Yeah. About religion, but today it's about relationship. It's about a God that wants to know you. That's so beautiful. Not just I can know Him, but the desire that He has to know us. So every week we want people to grow in their journey of knowing God. Maybe 40 years you've been in church, you can still know God more. Because we want to share with you and for you to see the possibilities that God has prepared and provided for each and every one of our lives. In other words, we want to give you the right tools. Just like with Easter, we want to give you the tools to invite people. We want to give you the tools to be a better husband and parent. We want to give you the tools to be a better student. We want to give you the tools to be a better worker, a better Christian, a better friend. But what happens in our life is this. We've got to work through some frustrations. There's frustrations in life. Here's one of the biggest frustrations I know I face in life. Are you ready? What I expect or want and what I receive. Anyone with me on that? There can be a gap between that and that gap can be the greatest frustrations of our life. What I expect and what I receive in my life. That gap of frustration. And we've got to mind the gap because something can happen if we don't handle our frustrations right. Because here's what happens. My frustrations are going to take me backwards, not forwards. Come on. Frustration is that which destroys my trust. It's not going to build my trust. Frustration is that which increases my doubt. It doesn't build my faith. Come on, if I'm frustrated, I'm not feeling my faith rise inside of me. I'm feeling doubt come because I'm expecting God to do something. I'm not seeing it. I'm frustrated. So what happens? I don't fall to the faith side. I fall to the doubt. Sorry. Frustration will separate us. It doesn't connect us. It doesn't bring us closer Together, are you getting the picture today? Yeah. Come on, say with me, mind the gap. Mind the gap. Mind the gap. Why? Because there's a process to get from here to there. There's a process that we need to go through. Listen to our scripture again, and I just want to say this. If this scripture doesn't stir you, if this scripture doesn't challenge you and excite you, then I'm not sure what will. You need to check your pulse because you're dead. In other words, 
Here it goes, 2 Corinthians 6, 11 through 13 from the Message Bible. Dear Corinthians, and you can put your name in there. Dear Seth and Chelsea. Dear Don Johnson. You know we've got a movie star in the house? Don Johnson on the front row right there. There he is, there he is in the house. Why? Because you've got to understand, the scripture is addressed to you. If it's in the Bible, it's for you. Amen. God didn't write that and say, sorry, that's not for you, that's for someone else. If it's in the Word of God, yes. there's a truth, there's yes. something in yes. there for you. It's got a promise for you. Come on, all the promises of God, they are for you. So dear you, whoever you are, it's in there for you. Paul says, I cannot tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open, spacious life. Come on. Something possible for you. Come on, you need to hear me today. Something possible for you. He's not writing to frustrate you. He's writing of the possibilities that are available. He said, we did not fence you in. We didn't enslave you is the other thought. Wow. We didn't put you in that bondage. Yeah, yeah. We didn't put you in that condemnation. The smallness that you feel comes from where? It comes from within you. Your life isn't small, but you are living in a small way. Wow. Wow. Come on, we could go home with that one. I mean, we could go home with that one. Your life ain't small. Come on, your life ain't broken, used up, has been. Come on, your mind is not small. That's not what God created. God created you to live big, but you are the one that's living in a small way. Come on, you're the one that's living. How many times does the enemy want us to focus on the restrictions instead of the liberties? And that's where we live so many times. Living in the restrictions. Adam and Eve had everything in the garden but one thing. What was the one thing they wanted? The one thing that they didn't have. That's the sin nature. That's the enemy trying to make us live small. And if you don't believe me, put a sign on a wall and says, wait, wet paint and see what happens. <laughs> Come on, you never had ever any intention of ever touching that wall until someone put a sign on there. You, you didn't like that wall. You didn't want to be near that wall. Yeah, there was nothing yeah. that that wall had that interested you until someone put that sign on there. And all of a sudden, you're intrigued by that wall. You're drawn to that wall and you... <laughs> and then here's what you say. You get ready. Oh, it's wet. <laughs> And that's the smallness that we are living in and that's not what God has. The enemy wants to keep us restricted. He wants us to keep us drawn into the restrictions instead of seeing the liberties that we have. Come on, your life isn't small, you're just living small. Paul says, I'm speaking as plainly as I can. And Paul says, I'm speaking with great affection. In other words, here's what I believe. He said, I'm concerned about what I'm seeing. I'm concerned about what I'm hearing. I'm concerned about the type of life that you're choosing to live. And I'm telling you, we're concerned too. I'm concerned as a pastor. That's why we're preaching this message. He says, open up your lives. Now, when I read the Word of God, I, I picture things. I'm very kind of picturesque or whatever, visual, that's, that's it, visually stimulated. I like to see things, imagine things with my mind. And when I read something like that, open up your life, I don't see someone just like peering through a little crowd. Right that, does anyone with me? That's not open. I see someone first thing in the morning standing before a big window where the curtains are drawn and you just grab those curtains and you just go, oh, like that. And all of a sudden, can you imagine what's happening? The sunlight comes bursting into that room and now all of a sudden something that's dead and dark and miserable and it's illuminated and alive. that are available. Because yes. he says, I want you to open up your life and live openly. Yeah. And live expansively. Come on, say wow with me. Wow. Say it backwards. Wow. 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 God is awesome. 
God is awesome. Yeah. And I want to go on record saying, I believe that's a rhema word for your life. Yeah. Yeah. If you were here a few months ago, we explained that a rhema word is a word that comes alive. Yeah. That it's not just words on a page, that's logos. The word of God is logos, it's words on a page. Yeah. But there's a revelation of those words that God wants you to grab a hold of. He wants it to come alive in your life. I believe those verses want to come alive in your life. Yeah. They need to come yeah. alive yeah. in your life. Yeah. That scripture has it all. But does God have it all? No. The scripture has it all. But does God have all of your life? Over the next two weeks, I want to talk about transitioning from two main areas of restriction. And I know there's more. But I think these two that we're going to be talking about over the next two weeks are probably two of the biggest. Because we're going to be talking today about worry. And next week we're going to be talking about unforgiveness. How do I transition from a place of worry to relationship and peace? How do I transition from a place of unforgiveness to a place of freedom? Come on, how do I transition from the restrictions into God's freedom. How do I wide open my life? Yes. Come on, how do I live a wide open life? Mm. And here's how I want to begin this message today. Here's the filter I want you to look at this message through. Because if we don't watch, the enemy can still pile condemnation on us. Because when we expose what needs to be truth in our lives, it also exposes the error of our lives. And the error of our lives has its way of living in regret, that we regret, oh, if only I could go back, I could have saved my marriage. If only I could have gone back, I could have kept my job. If only I... And, and thank God for those things as a reference point. But we can't live there. The answers are not in our past. They are lessons for our future. But today, I want you to live with this filter in your life. I want you to hear this for your life today moving forward. Because I don't want this to be condemnation. I want you to say, okay, I can make the change. And now today forward. Do you, are you with me? Because I can't change the past. But I can change today, which will change my life forever. So are you ready today? Come on, nudge someone around and say, wake up, are you ready today? We're going to transition from worry to relationship. Why, why to relationship, Pastor? Surely it should be worry to peace. Well, because peace is an only found in true relationship with Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace. If I'm going to have peace, I've got to go to who peace is. And we're going to be talking about that at the end of this message. How can I have peace in my relationship with God? But look at the definition of worry in the dictionary. It's feeling anxious or to be uneasy. In other words, it means to cause great uneasiness, care or anxiety in your life. It's actually derived from a German word that's called Wurgen. W-U-R-G-E-R. -E which literally means this. Are you ready? It means to strangle, wow. to constrict, and to choke. Are you seeing the picture? Yeah. What worry wants to do, it's like that snake, that boa constrictor. It wants to gently wrap itself around you so it will ultimately squeeze every bit of life out of you. Worry is a sin. Yes. Worry is a sin. And you may say, but Pastor, why, why, why is worry a sin? Because it attacks against our belief and faith in God. And let's be honest, it's an attack that we all fall victim to. It does everything it can to undermine God's ability and therefore to destroy the trust that we have in God. It destroys our relationship. Oh no, I'm just worrying. No, it's out to destroy your relationship and steal your peace. Here's the truth today. If you're taking notes, you need to. It's on you version. Follow it on the app. Every week on notes. Look at this thought. If we really believe God, we would never worry. That, that's hard to grasp for many of us, but it's the truth. If we really believed God, we would never worry. End of story. We like to throw in a tagline, oh, but you don't understand this. And you don't. No, end of story. If we really believed and trusted God, we would never worry. Now, I didn't say 
you're not saved because you worry. So breathe, just relax. I didn't call you a heathen and a sinner and you're going to hell. But I will say this, you're not living totally free. I didn't say for one second you didn't love God. I didn't say for one second you didn't have faith. But I truly believe this, you are robbing yourself from the relationship that God desires to have with you. Yeah. You see, you build a relationship upon you instead of upon what He has made fully possible. For you, I love this scripture, Mark 9, 23. Pastor Pete touched on it today. Jesus said to him, Here's the father of a possessed child that brought him to the disciples. The disciples couldn't heal him. Now they bring him to Jesus. And Jesus looks at this man and says, If you can believe, all things are possible to what? To him who Please, verse 24. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears. It's a picture of desperation that we see. He cries out with tears, Lord, what? I believe. Stop, stop right there. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. God, I believe in you and I love you. God, God I serve you. But how many realizes to our belief there's a but? There's a but. There's a but. Because the man is saying these words, God, I, I believe that you're able. But then all of a sudden his mind is going back to the, to the condition that he's living with and seeing his son go through day after day, month after month. So he's dealing with the fact, God, I want to believe you, but God, I, I, I've lived with this. God, I, I've seen the results of this. We've done everything we can and nothing helped. God, I want to believe you, but God, yeah. I'm struggling. Yeah. God, we live in torment. We can't go out because we don't know when this demon or whatever is going to manifest. We don't know when it's going to torture him and, and try to kill him. We don't know. The fear, God, if you only understood. Can you see the worry that can come into the belief that God wants us to have? So what does the Father go on to say? God, I believe, but what? Help my unbelief. Just like us. God, I know you're God. But will you do it for me? I know you can. I know you're more than able. But God, will you? Can you? Help me to believe not only in it. But God, I need you to help me believe for it. For my life. For my situation. Come on, today, so many of us say, God, I believe you. But we're living in a state of worry. Yeah. Which is distrust. We're not really trusting and believing. And one thing I've realized is this. Are you ready? It's not in your notes, but take this down. Our faith is shrunk back to our unbelief. Yeah. Where there's unbelief, faith cannot grow. Faith is limited. Worry is a form of disbelieving the promises of God. And we're going to see that. You see, worry is a tool of Satan, right? Because he knows what God is capable of doing through your life and in your life. So Satan wants to rob and steal and destroy. That's all he's got. Yeah. So he attacks that belief. He takes that from you. And he attacks you in all shapes and all different forms. Maybe today you're sitting here and you know your life. And you are totally consumed by worry. Mm. And that's not something easy to admit. Yeah. Oh yeah, ha ha, that's me, praise God. <laughs> you know what keeps you awake at night. You know it's tormenting you. you. You know you're having panic attacks. Where's the brown paper bag? <laughs> Unfortunately, can I say this? There's more in the brown paper bag than just air many times because when we allow worry to take over, we fill that bag with everything else that the enemy has. And we think a little drink will help me and ease the pain and get it where it needs to come. I'm preaching better than this. Worry, worry, worry. It consumes you. Are you ready for this crazy truth today? And it's crazy because of this. We all know we shouldn't worry. We all know we shouldn't worry. We know it doesn't help anything. We even tell people that, but yet we still do it. We even know it's bad for our health. And if you didn't know that, you do now, so that's something else to worry about. Yeah. 
we still find ourselves doing it over and over again. Matthew 6, 25. Let's go to the Word of God. He says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. It's pretty clear right there. God says, do not worry about your life. In other words, every part of your life, God says, don't worry about. He puts it all in one thing. Don't worry about your life. He goes on to say, don't worry about what you'll eat or what you'll drink. Don't worry about your body and what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Please know he's not saying we shouldn't be concerned with those things. You've got to concern yourself of taking care of yourself and clothing yourself and looking half decent. Do I hear an amen? Because that's a responsibility that he's given to us. He goes on to say, verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? See what happens with the birds. They do the possible and God does the impossible. In other words, God works with their ability. They don't store, they don't provide for their lives, but they go out every day trusting and believing that God is going to be that provision and truth for their lives. Verse 27, but which of you by what? Oh, but pastor, it's okay. It's just concern. No, it's worry. It's concern on steroids. It's killing you. That's robbing you. Which of you, by worrying, the Bible says, can add one cubit to your stature? It's not going to increase your life. It's not going to build your life. Yeah. Verse 28. So why do you worry? Verse 31. Therefore, do not worry. Are you getting the picture? Verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will what? Worry about its own things. Because there's enough things going on in today. Amen. There's enough struggles today without you worrying about tomorrow. Listen to me. God's word is very clear. We cannot allow worry to continue to place a stranglehold. <laughs> Upon us, because it wants to constrict our lives, to choke our lives. Come on, we've got to transition, mind the gap. We've got to transition from where we are to where God is and find relationship. You know, worry is even so bad that when we have nothing to worry about, we worry about it. Yeah, well, there's got to be something wrong because I know how that boss looked at me. Wow, what's going on? We think of things to worry about. I read this when I was studying. Worry is like a rocking chair. No. It will give you something to do and keep you going, but it won't get you anywhere. George Muller said these words. He says, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. And the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety or worry. I think worry is fear packaged with a red bow. Yeah, we, we justify it and label it whatever we want, but it's fear. It's distrusting God. Packaged all night. So ask yourself this. Come on, how does worry affect your life? When are you the most vulnerable to worry? How does it attack you? How does it make you feel? Is it really something that you enjoy? It's not. So I want to look at three points today about worry. And we're going to get to the relationships, so hang tight with me, because we're not just going to leave you with the problem, we're going to give you the solution. Number one, worry is not your friend. Worry is not your friend. I think I know that, Pastor. I mean, that's all you got. I came here. Come on, hold with me. Say with me, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. God, I believe, but you've got to help my unbelief. You see, we consciously understand that worry is no friend to us. We'll tell people, I don't know why I bother worrying, because it's no good. But yet the actions of our life and the way we live tell a completely different story. We clutch worry to our chest. Like that favorite stuffed animal that we had at childhood. We grab a hold of it and we hold it. We make excuses for it, we justify it. Why? Because we live with it. We dwell with it. Look at this statement, worry too often becomes the friend that we do not see. Yeah. If any of you have had children, most children, I remember I did, they have an invisible friend. 
Remember that friend you used to talk to? Yeah. That was kind of cute when you're three and four and you're talking to an invisible friend. But when you're in your thirties and forties and you're still talking to something that's not there, come on, people can go crazy. And that's what worry is. Worry is that friend that you don't see but you're holding on to and people are seeing it. And they're going, come on, you're crazy, let go of that thing. Yeah. Instead of thinking of worry just as worry, you've got to think of it this way. Worry is not trusting God. Yeah. Right. It's not trusting God. Although I believe in God, God, I believe. Worry admits that I trust more in my own ability than I have trusted in God's faithfulness yes. and His ability. Worry just proves that I don't trust God as I perhaps claim to do. Yeah. Philippians 4 verse 6 says these words. First four words. Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about nothing. And nothing means nothing. Just worried you didn't catch that. Amen? Nothing, listen to me, nothing includes even the most extreme and worst situation you could ever imagine or find yourself in. God says you don't have to even worry right there. Because I am bigger than that. Number two, worry is a sin. Now I mentioned that earlier, but let's revisit that for a moment. In Romans chapter 14 and verse 23, the last part of verse 23 says this words, For whatever is not from faith is sin. See that? Whatever doesn't come from faith is sin. In other words, everything that doesn't come from faith is sin. Worry is not faith. So therefore, worry... It's sin. What worry is the flip side of faith. It's literally the opposite of faith, but it's more than the opposite of faith. It's opposed to faith. Yeah. It's not just on the other side. It's fighting because it's in opposition also to faith. Living by faith means what? Believing God has everything under control. Yeah. For example, if you're sitting here today and you're living under constant fear, that you're going to lose your job. What you are essentially saying is this, that your job is your provider. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't God supposed to do that for you? Yeah. Just, just ask Him. Yeah. If you are sitting here today and you are fearful about what you see on the news and terrorism and attacks and everything, then what you're saying is this, God, you are not able to keep me, my family and my kids. Come on, can we take it one more further? If you are sitting there terrified to put your kids to school, uh -huh then you're not trusting the fact that God is able to provide and meet your needs. And God is able to protect your children. And He's your provider. And He's your source. And He's your strength. You're worried about a job that maybe God's got something better planned for you. Perhaps even though the path, or perhaps even though through the pathway of pain and sacrifice. But how many remembers God is more about the process than the... Where you arrive. Because if you arrive wrong, it doesn't matter. I heard someone, Pastor Greg Rochelle was preaching a message the other day from inside of a tent. He said these words, but God, you haven't brought someone into my life. You haven't done this. And he went down a whole list of things that someone was disappointed that God didn't do. And then he put his head out of the tent. And he said, you know why God didn't do those things? Because if God gave me everything I wanted, He could never exceed my expectations. All right, now. Wow. All right, now. Wow. Well, all right. You can have what you want, or you can allow God to exceed yeah. every yeah. expectation yeah. in your life. Yeah. What are you going to trust Him? Yeah. Mercy Lee brought out a song, maybe a year yeah. or so ago. It says, even if. Anyone heard the words? It's yeah. easy to sing, it says, when there's nothing to bring me down. But what will I say when I'm held to the flame like I am right now? Yeah. I know, God, you are able and I know that you can save me through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is you alone. They say it only takes a little faith 
to move a mountain. Well, good thing as a little faith is all I have right now. But God, when you choose to leave mountains unmovable, oh, give me the strength to be able to see it is well with my Come on, one of the greatest definitions of worry I've ever heard is this. Worry is the sin of distrusting the promises and the power of God. We read in Matthew 6, don't worry. And here's the reason why God tells us not to worry. Number one, because He knows our end from our beginning. God sees the whole picture. We see the moment. God sees the picture. God knows that weeping may endure for the night, but joy is coming in the morning. Why does He know that? Because He wrote the book. And He knows that if you just keep on trusting, you keep believing, and you keep having faith. You know they say that 90% of the things we're afraid of and worry never even materialize and happen in our lives. God sees the end from the beginning. And you know why else? God can say words like that because He knows His ability. He knows how big He is. He knows how great He is. And no one else can play that except my God. Only God. Come on, number three. Worry is a control issue. Worry is a control issue. I laugh with this all the time. Kelly and I heard this, that if someone has a fear of flying, they say that's a control issue. I call Kelly a control freak because she's afraid to fly. But that's what they say. It's a control issue because you can't control it and you, and you can't handle all that. That's what worry is for many of us. It's a control issue. Why? Because worry is obsessed with trying to control every circumstance of your life. It wants to control your thoughts. It wants to control your actions. And it wants to control whether you can or cannot do something. Yeah, really cool. Now, there, of course, there are things that we must control and do. There are things that we have to be responsible for, and God requires that of us. God wants us to do the possible, just like the birds of the air. They go out to eat every day, trusting that God will do the impossible. So here we are. We worry like it's going to help and change our situation. I've never heard anyone worry themselves into getting well. Maybe sick. I've never seen traffic clear out of the way and I arrive on time because of worry. I've just countless times seen myself arrive late and totally stress out to the max. Worry has never, nor can ever help any situation. It just makes it worse. Worry indicates that we are not willing to let God handle certain things in our life. Come on, say with me, transition. Come on, God wants us to go into the wide open, spacious life. I'm telling you today, you ain't small. Come on, you're just living in a small way. And it's not anyone else's fault, it's your fault. Let me Quickly, I've got to close this message. Let me give you four steps to transition from worry to relationship and peace. Number one, you've got to get to know God more. You've got to get to know God more. One person wrote of all his years of study, he said, the more I study and the more I learn, the more I realize how little I know. Why? Because God is so expansive. God is so great. His love is beyond anything you could ever imagine. And the more I know about God, the more I know He loves me. The more I know He forgives me. The the more I know that he is crying out to be in relationship. I need to build relationship with that. I don't need to tell myself God doesn't love me because that's a lie. I need to tell him that God loves me so much. And I've got to choose to fill the void with him. Have you ever been on a vacation and you're looking for a hotel? Come on, no vacancies. What do you do? Go to the next one. No vacancies. That's what you need to do when worry comes past your life. It needs to see a sign outside and say, There ain't no room for you in here. I'm filling that place with God. I'm filling that place with my relationship with God. I want to have so much.
much of God in my life that there's not room for anything else. Let me give you five tools. Can I give you quickly five tools that will help you know God more? Number one, be in the house. Come on, be in church. Faithfully. Faithfully. Don't just be in church and get in your fix for the month and say, okay, I've crossed that off, now God's going to bless me. You need to be in church. I, I would be afraid to miss church here because you ain't going to know what you're going to miss. Amen? Come on, there's some good things that's happening in this church. Anyone feel better from just being here today? Come on, let's go this place. You would have got this at home. Oh, you would have enjoyed a good message through Facebook. You would have heard great praise and worship. But there's something about being in the atmosphere of other people and, and just being reachable and touchable and feeling it for yourself. Come on, you need to be in the house of God. But I'm telling you this, you don't need to just be in the house, you need to be the house. You need to be serving in the house. If you're not serving, if you're not volunteering in this house, there is a void because of you. There's a need that we have for everyone to serve. And the need is this, not for the house, the need is for you. Because you need it more than what we need it. I'm telling you right now. You need it for your life. You need to sign up for Growth Track. If you have never been through Growth Track, every Sunday at 11 o'clock, you can start today in the back room there. 11 o'clock, give us four weeks and we'll give you a new life. I really believe that because yeah. we're going to help you to discover your purpose. Yeah. Because so many people are living for God and have no idea what their purpose is in life. Nah. Yeah. What a tool of the enemy. Number two, you've got to be in the Word. That's a great tool. Yeah. You've got to be in the Word. Come on, read it every day. We put daily devotions out with a reading plan every day. Be in the Word. It can even read it to you. I mean, how easy is that? Be in prayer. Yes. Pray every day. Give God five minutes of your life and I'm telling you, it will transform your life. Yes. Number four, you've got to be in a group. Yes. You've got to be in a group. I'm telling you right now, the people that we are seeing the greatest growth and building in their lives right now are people who are in group. Yes. I, I'm going to say that again. The people who are seeing the greatest change in their life is because they're in a group. It's not the magic of being in a group. It's the magic of connecting with other people. It's the magic of saying, oh, what, you too? And you realize you're not the only freak in the box. Come on now. That you realize, okay, so together we can kind of de-freak out. Come on now. That we can together help each other and we can grow. Come on, you need to get in a group. You can jump in a group at any time. Come on, when I walked out of this church on Tuesday night, we were doing some work in the back, and when I walked out and Jim was teaching a men's Bible study, my heart sunk inside of me when I saw only three men around that table. Oh, wow. oh. Now thank God for those three men, and we're going to preach to those three men like they're 3,000 people, because every one of them is important. But my heart cried out and said, where's all the men that need the word of God? Where's the men that are seeking God? Come on, you need to be in the room. Need to be in a group. Ladies, there's opportunities. There's fun. Married, there's still opportunities. Get in a group. Come and pray on a Wednesday night. Bible studies. Opportunities Friday nights. Come on, there's something nearly every day that you can be a part of. Number five, you need to tithe. Tithing is an incredible tool to help you to know God in a greater way. Did you realize that when Jesus was on this earth and he told stories or parables, do you realize that he talked more about money than anything else? No. And you know why Jesus talked about money more than anything else? Because he knew that would be one of the most major battles that you and I would face. Our, our inability to trust him with our finances. And to put him to the work. Come on, pay your tithe. Number two, you've got to live in wisdom. If I'm going to have a relationship and live in peace, I've got to live in wisdom, which simply means I've got to do what is wise. Kelly and I are still in our house right now. We pray every day that God would help us with that. But you know what else we've done? We've listed it. We've put it on the market. Is that okay? We, we put it on the market. That means we don't have no faith in our prayers. No, we're just, we're just being wise. We're walking in wisdom. I thank God I'm praying, but I'm also doing in the natural what I need to do. Incidentally, emerged properties, you need to list the greatest realtors in the house. Come on, Christy Handy on the front row right there. Doing a good job. Come on, then what else have we got to do? We don't just list it, we've got to make it ready. We've got to turn the lights on, clean everything, make it look good. That's our responsibility, that's wisdom. Yes. Come on, you've got to do what's within your control and then trust Him to do the things that are without your yeah, control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So many people want to do God to do everything. Yeah. Yeah. Listen to me, they want God to do everything. 
You want to be in relationship with God, you've got to live with wisdom. Yeah. Remember the scripture we started earlier, Philippians 4, let's finish it, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. In other words, we do what is wise wisdom, and we can live peacefully and leaving the rest to God. The last time I checked, that's also called living by faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trust in God. Yeah. And even after that, if you find yourself beginning to worry, you've got to remind yourself that God is bigger than your problems and He wants you to trust Him with it all. Yeah. How many of you ever set an alarm in the morning to wake you up? Anyone set an alarm to wake you up in the morning? Okay, here's what you need to do. You ready? You need to let worry be your alarm and signal. Wow. That when you begin to worry, that's your alarm. The bells start ringing. And you know what that tells you? I need to start to pray. Come on, I, I need to start to pray. Because when we pray about our worries, we are giving our burdens to Him. That's walking in wisdom. Number three, you've got to think good thoughts. Notice good thoughts. I put God, uh, I put God thoughts rather than not good thoughts. Why? Because when they're God thoughts, they are good thoughts. But every good thought is not always a God thought. All right. All right. Yes. All right. Philippians 4, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, noble, just, yes. pure, lovely. If there's a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, what? Meditate. Think on these things. When we give control over to God, we pray and we trust Him with our worries. What happens? We shift our minds from fear-based thinking to faith-based thinking. Yes, His ways and His timing may still be different, but God, you know best. Look at this. Worry is the result of trying to carry a burden that never belonged on my shoulders in the first place. Got to give it to God. Give my thoughts, my concerns, and last but not least, the man can come up. No matter what, trust. Trust. Even if. Even if. Even if. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. Well, most of us are lack of understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And He will. Direct your paths. Every one of them. So what does worry do? It makes me distrust the promises and the power of God. I read a verse like that. If you worry, I say that's not true. Because I distrust the promises and the power of God. I look and say, but God is not able to do that. His ability is not big enough to help me. Come on, what have we got to do? Don't worry. We've got to be happy. Just a little song I wrote. But again, that's a lie too. Because if all you want is happiness, you're missing something now. Because happiness is based on happening. Come on, we don't have to worry. But we need to be filled with joy. Because joy is that inner fortitude that wants to give us the strength and the peace that we need despite the happenings around us. Come on, mind the gap. Mind the gap. We've got to transition from worry to relationship where we'll find peace in God. And you know why? Because God did not make you small. God did not make you small. Bow your heads all over this.
place today where we're saying, God, I believe you, but we've got to handle that unbelief today. Can we do that? As they continue singing, come on, the altars are open. If you need this message, you need something of this message. Come on, if you need to just step forward and say, that's me. I need worry to die in my life. Come on, I've got to trust God. I'm tired of distrusting the power and the ability of God in my life. Come on, I'm trusting Him in a greater way. Come on, all over this place, just respond, would you? Just begin to come all over this place. Come on.
Blessed, blessed, blessed week. Come on, get in the group. 